Real estate investing can have an incredible upside, but it can also ruin your life. I wanna share some of the nightmares that I've had in my career and the solutions that we created for those nightmares. Please learn from my unfortunate experiences so you don't have to go through them yourself. If you're new here, welcome. If you're familiar with our channel and our content, you've seen that I constantly insist that mindset is so important. Because if you don't have the right mindset and you don't have the right education in real estate investing, you can really end up doing some damage to yourself, your family, and your financial future. The first fix and flip I ever did, we nicknamed Brook Hill. Now obviously, your first fix and flip is your scariest fix and flip because as human beings, we're usually terrible at things that we've never done before. You may have studied how to do it, but on the first one, you have no practical knowledge and no real world experience on how it's supposed to be done. This is pretty much where I was at the end of 2013 when I purchased my first investment property. I had purchased and attended real estate education before I had bought this house to the tune of $20,000. I felt confident in my knowledge, but more importantly, I was sick of my job. I was sick of working for the man and I knew I had to get out of my comfort zone if I was going to grow. So when an agent that I knew brought me this house, I ran the numbers like I had been taught. Everything seemed like it was going to work out. So I bought the house and I took on the project. We are in a totally different market climate now than we were at the end of 2013. This house is probably worth closer to $700,000 at the time of this recording, but I bought this house for $205,000. We hired a contractor to come in and fix it up. And the goal was to list it for $315,000 when we were done with a profit of close to $30,000, which means our break even point was around $285,000. We got through the construction process in a few months and we put it on the market for 315,000. Now, this property was in Cottonwood Heights, Utah, a very desirable area. This particular flip is what we refer to as a mid-level flip, meaning our target buyer is a middle-class individual or family. We thought we did a pretty good job, but you know, I hadn't really developed a template yet. I really didn't have a great understanding of what we should be putting into these properties and what things that we should avoid putting into these properties. That being said, it turned out decent. It wasn't great, it wasn't perfect, but it turned out okay. This house sat on the market, priced at 315,000 for 90 days. At this point, I started to get a little nervous. Needless to say, my credit and money partners were starting to get a little frustrated with me. We had just spent all of this money on the house with the idea that we were supposed to make $30,000 that we'd be splitting up at the end. And it was just sitting there, no offers. We dropped the price, 305,000, 295,000, still nothing. No offers, no showings, crickets. It was spring of 2014 at this point. I was still working my sales job, making like $40,000 a year. We were spending about $45,000 a year. We didn't have any money or any credit to refinance our partners out. We were sunk. So as this thing sat and sat and sat on the market, the level of fear that I was experiencing inside grew and grew and grew. How disappointing. This was my first deal. To this point, it had gone fairly smoothly, but now I looked like a fool and I needed a way to save it. I did something that in retrospect, I wouldn't do again. I asked my mom and dad to sign on a mortgage for the house. They so kindly obliged and I moved my wife and my two dogs into the house. I ended up living there for two and a half years as I continued to do fix and flips and build my rental portfolio. Luckily, I got better and better at real estate investing as time went on, but the house I lived in was a constant reminder of my failure. To add insult to injury, I had a much higher house payment now. The failure contributed to my divorce from my first wife and put me in a funk that lasted almost a year. I felt that I had let my partners down. I had felt that I had let my parents down. And worst of all, I had let myself down. My worst fear had seemed to come true, that I was no good at this, that I would be limited to a simple average life and that I had no business playing with the big boys. This project didn't go how I expected. It didn't align with any of my fantasies about house flipping. I was sad, I was discouraged, I was depressed. And most of all, I was mad. I was mad at the stupid TV shows that made it seem easy. I was mad at my mentors that told me I could do it. I was mad at myself for taking a risk that at the moment I felt I had no business taking. I wallowed for months. 
until a good friend and real estate mentor, Matt Strong, reached out to me and told me that I was fine, that it was just part of being in the business, and that the only way I was going to make up for it was to keep going, keep getting better with every deal. I remembered a quote from Nelson Mandela, I never lose, I win or I learn. And I realized at that moment that the only way I could fail is if I give up and stop taking action. Now luckily that deal wasn't a total loss. I could have lost the house, lost my partner's money. Instead, I was able to get my credit and cash partners paid back because of the refi that my parents so kindly helped me with. And I was able to sell the house two and a half years later for an incredible six-figure profit. And the lessons that I learned made me a better real estate investor today. So what did I learn? What would I do differently now if I could go back and give myself advice? Well, there are four things that I would go back and tell 26-year-old Mitch. Number one, time heals all in real estate. Real estate is the ideal investment. That's an acronym you'll hear me use a lot on this channel. The I stands for income. This is the cash flow you make on rentals or seller finance deals that comes in monthly. The D stands for deductions. Real estate is the best source of tax deductions that I know of. You can save huge amounts on taxes by simply understanding and owning real estate. The E stands for equity. This is the difference between what you paid for a property and the amount you owe to the bank, which lowers over time as you pay your mortgage payment. The A stands for appreciation. This is the difference between what you paid for the house and what it's worth now. This number is likely to increase the longer you hold onto the property. And the L stands for leverage. This represents your ability to borrow against your equity or appreciation so that you can utilize the value without having to sell the house. So what do I mean by time heals all in real estate? Well, I'm referring to the E and A in that acronym, or equity and appreciation. When we originally listed the house after the remodel, it was a dud. We couldn't sell it. I lived in the house for two and a half years and paid the mortgage down a little, and it appreciated to the point that I made over $100,000 profit on that deal. Now, these results are not typical to most investors, but if you look at it scientifically, it makes sense. Real estate has the longest recorded data historically over any other investment category, with close to 200 years of information on what the market has been doing. It helps us understand market cycles, how the market behaves, and it helps us predict what the market's going to do to some degree of accuracy. More importantly, we can see an average and recognize what real estate does year over year, even taking into account things like the Great Depression in the 1930s and the Great Recession in the 20 knots and 20 teens. Even taking into account those terrible financial and economic catastrophes, as well as the great years for real estate, like 2020 and 2021, the data tells us that real estate appreciates, on average, about 4% a year. So worst case scenario, just make sure you have a plan that allows you to hang onto the property for a few years. Which leads me to my next lesson, the debt equity blend. Remember, I had purchased and attended real estate investor education before I bought this house. I had educated myself to what I thought was an acceptable level, but nothing can replace real world experience. I had learned that you should always have exit strategies in real estate, most importantly with the money that you use to finance your deals. I used a very simple, stripped down version of a funding strategy that I use religiously today. And it's evolved into what I call the debt equity blend. Obviously, if you take out a loan against your fix and flip that is equal to or greater than what you'd be able to sell it for, you're not gonna be able to refinance if anything goes wrong because banks rarely refinance 100% debt to equity ratio and never, to my knowledge, refinance over 100%. You wouldn't wanna do this even if you did sell the property as a flip because there would be no profit in it. Trust me, you want to get paid. It can also be dangerous to finance 90% or even 80% of the sale value because what if the market dips and the value goes down when it's time to sell it? You may still lose money even then. Always have a backup strategy in mind. The debt equity blend calls for two thirds of the money that you need to do the deal, defined as purchase costs plus remodel costs plus holding costs to be raised as debt. Get a loan from a hard money lender, from a bank, from your grandma. Debt's cheap, but it's also risky because in most cases, you're promising to pay them back plus interest no matter what happens to the deal. If you don't, they get to keep the house. The other one third of the money should be raised as equity. Look for partners on the deal that are willing to bring their cash to the table in exchange for a percentage of ownership in the property and the profit. 
As partners, they follow the property, meaning if you sell it, they get cashed out with a portion of the profit. But if you need to convert it into a rental, they are now partners with you in a rental deal. Structuring the money this way gives you a built-in 33.3% equity position on the property, which will allow you and your partners to go back and refinance out the debt with a 30-year mortgage and a low payment. That leaves plenty of meat on the bone to rent the house out, collect cash flow as a partnership, and then sell the house a few years down the road for potentially more profit than you had originally planned on. And you got to keep all that cash flow in the interim. This is an amazing strategy that I go into great detail on in a class that I teach called Real Estate Deals Using Other People's Money. If you'd like to watch it, I've included a link to the class in the description. On this part, I feel like I did okay. The thing I would change though, is that I would have rented it out or sold it on seller financing rather than having moved into it. Which leads me to my next lesson, rent it. Rentals are amazing investments if you structure them right. They're also a great backup plan for your flips that don't go as planned. Rentals allow you to take advantage of all five aspects of the ideal acronym, whereas deals like fix and flips only take advantage of one or two of those aspects. The last lesson is seller finance. Seller financing is a strategy where the buyer and seller agree at a purchase price, and then the seller accepts monthly payments, usually with interest, until the contract is paid in full. Basically, the seller is also the bank. Oftentimes, the seller still has their mortgage in place, but the buyer's payment is higher than the seller's mortgage payment, so there's cash flow. There are ways you could take advantage of this awesome strategy as a buyer or a seller. Ultimately, selling your property on seller financing gives you the same basic perks that rentals do, mainly cash flow. Selling your property on seller financing does provide some bonuses that rentals don't. When you have a rental, you are the landlord and you are responsible for the overall maintenance of the property, having to occasionally replace furnaces, water heaters, air conditioning units, roofs, etc. This can oftentimes eat up all of your hard-earned cash flow in a single swoop. When you sell a house on seller financing, you're the bank, not the landlord. If you have a mortgage, you know very well that if the water heater goes out, you are responsible, not the mortgage company. The same is true in seller financing situations. The buyer is responsible for all the maintenance on the property. Of course, there are risks in any of these strategies, so make sure you're educated before you go out and buy any real estate. A great place to start is our education channel with over 500 hours and over a dozen courses to choose from. There's no better place to start getting your investor legs. Best of all, we made it free just for you. I'm curious what you thought of this flippin' nightmare. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share or if you would have done something differently, please comment in the comment section below. If you liked the video, please offer up a sacrifice to the YouTube algorithm gods and smash that thumbs up button. Also, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell as we'll be bringing you more of this amazing content very soon. See you on the flip side.